All right, I'm Alex. I'm like the main flat pack guy, and I'm here to talk about what happened in the last year and what we plan to do in the coming year. So apparently, August 7th, that's a year and a couple of days ago, I did this talk last year. I guess some people were there. Um, it's a bit, that was a bit more technical talk, and I'm trying to be more high level this time. Although there will be some technical details. So what happened? Well, there was the great renaming. We were getting to a place where XDG app was decent enough for wider use. And we wanted to do PR and a website. And everyone keeps saying that the name sucked. And it did. I mean, XDG as a entity doesn't really exist. It's the old name for free desktop. I don't even know what it stands for. Cross desktop, or is it X11 desktop, or something? Probably cross desktop group or something. That's not really a name that sticks around anymore. So, and also the app part makes it really cumbersome. It's like, I made an XTT app app. It doesn't work. Uh, so we had this discussion, and we had more discussions, and we made lists, and all the names we came up with were like Appy Mac App Face and <laughs> shit. So eventually, Christian came up with Flatpak, which is, I think, a pretty good name. And, and good names are hard to come by these days. So we got the domain name. It's pronounceable. Like the misspelling makes it easy to Google for, and things like that. I think that was that was a good thing. It was a good name. Kind of painful to rename everything. We still have some things not quite there yet, like the mailing list is still called XTT app, but most things have changed. And following that, we made the new website, where, where Alan and Jacob did. Uh, it's pretty good. I like it. It's not technical at all, basically. It looks good. It's, it's a good introduction thing. And then we have the wiki for all the bullshit that us technical people need. And then we moved all the code to GitHub. I think organization-wide, free desktop is the right place for Flatpak to live. But the site and the like sysadmin stuff not happening and everything being really slow to move forward is made it impossible. So we moved to GitHub. I think that's the right choice. More people will come there. It's easy to work with. We can actually like create new Git repositories by just clicking instead of, you know, filing a bug, waiting a week, finding Ajax. Do this thing needs to. No, oh, it's just it's just a lot better. And also, a year of work on features, bug fixes, polishing just makes Flatpak a much better product than it was a year ago. But these are not super interesting details to go into in the talk, so I'll just say that we did an ass load of work, and it's now better. And then instead, I'll talk about the, the larger things we added and the more major features. One of the things we added were Flatpak Builder. Um, before we added this, Flatpak was really a, like a low-level tool. And if you wanted to build something, you had to script it. And I had my own scripts to build the runtimes and whatnot. And they were like horrible hacks. Uh, so we added this tool called Flatpak Builder, which is a way to uh, nicely script building dependencies, basically. So it, it's, it's based on, or vaguely based on, Colin's thing called the Build API which is a fancy name for configure, make, make, install. But having the idea that most dependencies are actually built the same way, we can just basically list the list of tarballs, and it can just build them. And then you can start from that, and there are ways to make it handle things that are non-standard. But the most standard way, you just, you just list them, and they build. And then maybe you have to add a patch. Maybe it has some weird homegrown thing. We also added CMake support, because a lot of stuff are moving towards that. Uh, 
we added AppStream support. AppStream is this free desktop project for uh, application metadata. Uh, before we added this, there was nothing really user-level metadata about application in Flatpak. So AppStream is something that all the distros use, or most of them. Uh, Fedora, Debian, I don't know who else uses it. Uh, yeah. So most people use it, and most apps actually have AppStream data, so we can just use that. So what we did was added support in Flatpak for collecting uh, AppStream uh, files from the various apps and, and creating an AppStream branch for every repository so we can easily like download the latest metadata for the entire uh, repository. And then we have Flatpak locally storing the metadata and the icons so that GNOME software can easily show you the nice images and uh, text and stuff. Uh, and that's the other thing we did. We actually made GNOME software use this. And to do that, we added something called libflatpak, which is ex essentially a library that lets you avoid executing Flatpak. It has the same operations that Flatpak does, but as a library. So GNOME software uses that, and it can get all the regular data, and you can install stuff and run stuff. And it also has some intelligence to find the right runtime and automatically download that. We also moved to system-wide uh, installs by default. Actually, system-wide was always the default. It just was very painful because you have to be root to run it. Uh, so all the all the demos and examples use dash dash user to do install in your home directory. But we added like a privileged helper that uses policy kit. So now you just install system-wide and it pops up a dialogue. Do you really want to do this? Enter your password. It's very nice. Although you can still use uh, per user install. Very useful for debugging or development or if your sysadmin is locking down everything and you want to run something. We also added inside of Flatpak the most basic stuff to support the portals. Uh, the actual portal stuff, I will come to that later, it's not widely used yet, but the basics is the permission store and the document portal, which is inside Flatpak right now because they have to be somewhat tightly integrated, especially the document portal, um, because it uses FUC and you have to mount specific stuff depending on the, in the kind of app you run. And also, there's automatic support for allowing all apps access to the portal namespace. So anything in there you can just talk to already on the assumption that they are created in a way that's safe to access for everyone. XTG app used to have this thing called XTG app helper, which was the basic container setup uh, executable. It sometimes set UID, sometimes using user namespaces. But it had the core namespace setup, uh, set comp setup, all that. This is a very useful thing in general to have, so we extracted that into a project called Bubble Wrap, which kind of removed everything Flatpak specific and made this very generic way to launch things as a user, but in a, its own namespace. It's kind of like a shoot on steroids that you can run without being root. Um, it's now an Atomic project, so it's on the Atomic GitHub page. And we used inherit it as a submodule. But it's also useful in general. Like if you want to contain build system, it's a great way to do things. You just run whatever you want in like some subset of access to things or in a shroot or something like that. We also added a couple of new file formats. Uh, we added single file bundles, which is a way, given a repository, an OS3 repository, uh, we can extract like the latest version of an app as a single file that you can like mail someone or put on a USB stick 
and then you can install it. It's, it's a nice way to be able to distribute an app. I think it's not necessarily uh, the main way we, we want to do that, but especially for development, it's right. you can like mail someone the latest version and they can try it, and no infrastructure or anything required. We also added something called single-click repo files, which are just simple key-value pair files where you can Actually, they have, they have a MIME type, so if you click on them in Firefox, it will launch GNOME software, and it will ask you, this is the icon, the name of the repository, some descriptions, do you want to import this as a remote without having to type anything or figure out the GPG key or things like that. Obviously, there are some security issues there. You have to like download it from a secure site, HTTPS, and trust the domain and things like that. But it makes it a lot easier to distribute your app. You just have a single link. We did a lot of work on the on the free desktop and GNOME runtimes that we have. But the, the core is still based on Jocto, which is like an embedded thing that is easy to cross compile and build the basic tooling. We updated to the latest Jocto and we cleaned up our like layers on Jocto, so they're a lot more minimal. We upstream a bunch of patches, dropped some patches that weren't needed anymore. And then the layers above the Jocto base, which are the free desktop one and the GNOME one, which is layered on the free desktop layer, were converted from this horrible script I had that no one should ever look at into using Flatpak Builder. So that made them much more easily maintainable and understandable and just a joy to work with. Uh, we uh, re released, for the GNOME 20, 320 release, I did releases of the free desktop one and, and the GNOME runtimes. And we also have a daily build of Git master as a runtime, although that's not building at the moment, need to fix that. We got some help from uh, Endless and uh, on, on making ARM and Arch 64, ARCH 64, uh, ARM 64 bit to build. So we have build machines for those, and they're in the regular auto build system. So we have supported SDKs for 32 bit and 64 bit Intel and ARM, which is very nice. Uh, yeah, CodeThink have the machines for building the ARM stuff. And uh, we have a new machine on the GNOME infrastructure that does the Intel builds, which is good, because it used to be like, co-hosted with the uh, continuous build system and was kind of slow with all that happening. We're also seeing a lot of more community uptake as things stabilize. KDE has been doing initial work. They're using free desktop as a base and adding Qt and the base KDE libraries to it. It's still like an unstable project that they're not yet like releasing, but it's interesting to have someone working on that too. LibreOffice did like a better release and then a, an actual release as a flat pack. Endless uses it as a huge part of their operating system. And I, interestingly, PTV, the PTV project uses it as a way to share the development environment for all their developers, so they're always on the same like tools and versions of everything. It's an interesting use. And then we have, like in general, people are packaging stuff and, and trying to use Flatpak. And that was basically the major stuff that happened. And now I'm going to talk about the future. In the future, it's all about ponies. Oh, I mean, portals. Uh, portals are, it's a term we made up, but essentially it means a service in some way that is safe to give access to from a sandboxed uh, app. It's designed both the implementation and, and most importantly, the interface in such a way that you're not supposed to be able to attack the system using it. I mean, obviously, anything can have bugs. 
but, but the interfaces as specified are meant to be safe in one of several ways. So you could be inherently safe, you know, an interface that always returns 42 is safe to uh, give access to. An interface that always verifies that the caller is properly allowed to do this is also safe. Like many of the uh, uh, portals have used the permission store to store information, and when they get a request, they can, in a in a proper way, verify that this is actually this application and he has access rights. Or if he doesn't, we can deny or ask the user for, do we really want this or? And the most interesting way, I think, is that you can always allow it because inherent in the operation is a UI operation, like a file dialog or something where you can always cancel the operation in a natural way. For instance, if an application brings up a file dialog to read a file, it cannot use that to read some important file from the user because he would have to like somehow make the user pick that file and not be surprised and go, what the hell is this file dialog? Let's cancel it. Uh, so that's an interesting way to avoid all these. Do you really want to allow this app to do this or that, which is a pretty sucky interface, and instead have a natural flow of user uh, workflow. It's not always possible, but we try to make the interfaces such that there can be a natural way to do a UI that is cancelable, and it's like obvious if someone is trying to do something weird. And recently, me and Matthias started working at the desktop portal, which is the main desktop integration portal. So it's, it's, it's one project, one binary, but it's actually uh, doing multiple portals. Its implementation is a front-end, back-end split. So there's a single process, which is the security-sensitive portal. And it, in s it picks whichever backend is currently active and shells out to that or debuses out to that for the actual UI interaction. So we have a GDK backend called XTG Desktop Portal GDK, which has the UI stuff. And if you're running on a GNOME desktop or if that's the only thing you have installed, all the uh, things that require user interaction will be shelled out to that one. We also have a GNOME shell implementation of some of the portal backends. So you can do like full screen, unfakeable authentication dialogs, which is nice because then you can tell that it's officially a portal in some sense. Uh, we plan to do a Qt backend. If anyone is interesting, that'd be a great, possibly the wrong audience to ask, but. <laughs> uh, we kind of need that as a proof of concept that the uh, interfaces are good enough for generic use. We don't want to make the interfaces key, like GTK specific or GNOME specific. Uh, I guess it's mostly important for the larger interfaces like the file chooser. Anything that the uh, file chooser interface, any features in it should be able to be done by both the Qt and the GTK file chooser, for instance. Um, so with the, with the portal comes a set of Dbus interface definitions. And we also have code in GTK and glib, GIO to automatically use these uh, interfaces when we detect that we're running in a contained situation. So most of the time, you shouldn't even have to change any code to pick these up. Obviously, it's not always possible, but that's at least the goal. Sometimes you have to use the right APIs. Um, like the, for the file chooser, for instance, historically our file chooser APIs have been very tied to the details of GTK. Like it's an actual widget and you can poke into its sub widgets and whatnot. But recently we added a native file chooser API that is much more isolated from the details of the implementation, allowing us to do the Windows. Uh, like native file chooser 
but also like backing off a portal without you noticing anything different in the API. So if you're not doing anything special, consider using the native file chooser uh, APIs in your code. If you just want to read a file, it's easy that way. <coughs> so I'm going to go through the current portals we have in, in XDG desktop portal. Some of them are really simple, like the network monitor. This is basically, is the network online? Is it behind a captive portal? Do, do we have, like, is it online, but we, we don't have anything to talk to? And it's just a bunch of properties on this dbus object and a signal whenever it changes. So this is declared to be safe by just, you could probably detect whether you can ping someone anyway. It's just a more efficient way to get this information. We have a proxy resolver, uh, which is basically the lib proxy API made into a DBA service. And that is like what lib, what lib uses for its key proxy thing. So if you're running in a container, the GIO proxy code will just shell out to this, which instead in the, uh, in the portal implementation will call the normal glib uh, call, which then calls to uh, libproxy, picking up your desktop specific configuration of proxies and whatever horrible G JavaScript thing that happens for proxy resolution. We have a notification portal which is, I think, mostly the GTK notification API made into a portal. Uh, it's also mostly a proxy, but it has a permission check. So the first time, uh, is it always allowed first? And then you can disable it or something? Yeah. I, anyway, in the control center, there's like a list of things that use this thing and you can disable. If you don't never want notifications from this particular app, you can just disable it. And like all this, all the notification from that app will just dropped on the floor. There's a generic request object in the interface, which is how we represent like long going uh, requests. For instance, anything that has a, or possibly has a user interaction has a request object. Uh, you get a signal on it when the user like did did whatever he wanted to finish the operation. But if you, for some reason, want to close it early, there's a close operation, so you can request that you know get rid of that file chooser. The user already did something else. And these are used by the other things like the file chooser. <coughs> uh, this is, I guess, the most interesting thing uh, for for initial sandboxing, it opens a file chooser on the host side, and whatever file the user shows gets added to the document portal, and then we using the document portal, the document portal gives like a database-like identity for the, for the document, which is persistent over reboots, and also maps to a path in a future uh, file system mount, and then you create the path name for the Fuse, uh, for the file on Fuse, and you pass that back. And the interesting part about the Fuse file system is that inside each individual application, they see a subset of the Fuse file system based on what they're allowed to see. So every app can only see dynamically what's, what, what it is allowed to see. And that way you can open the file, you can replace it, or you know, and, and it's safe in the sense that it, for instance, you you cannot do in-place modifications of the file. You can only replace it. it. If you start a rewrite of it, it will not be visible outside of your sandbox until you close the thing and basically atomically say this file is now done. You, and you get a copy on the outside. So it should be safe. And implicitly, you give us kind of lifelong uh, access to this file by ever choosing it in the file chooser, which is 
probably mostly the right thing to do. Another important one is the open URI one. This is also one of the first things to show up because apps wants you uh, to view their help files. Like LibreOffice wants the help menu item to open the browser. So we have an open URI. It's a more generic one. You can also use it to open a file that will then open up in your it would ask you what applications do you want to open this in. And you, if you didn't want to open that URL, you can just close the application chooser. So it's safe in that sense. Depending on your desktop, you might want to handle the case where you want to remember whether it's OK to always open this app, for this app to always open this kind of file. I think for GNOME, we, we're currently like detecting if you're choosing the same time same thing over and over. Eventually, it just lets you do that without asking. But that's up to the back end of the portal to choose how you want to store that and what you want to allow. We have a printing portal. It's slightly more complicated because printing is complicated. But there's a prepare print call, which essentially is all the GUI stuff that goes with choosing a printer, choosing the paper and the layout and the paper size and the margins and all of that, and the details of the printer you eventually are going to print to. And then you get back, get back a handle and like information about uh, all the details that you, uh, the user choose. And then you can render your thing as a PDF and then send it. And you give the same handle to it. and. It, that way, it knows what, what you choose without the user or without the app knowing any details about the printer and whatnot. It's just an opaque thing that you can refer to whatever the user specified in, in the dialogue. And I think you also get some settings back so you can store it and resend it the next time. So you can, you can serialize the options the user shows and then you can feed it back the next time. There's a screenshot portal, which is not just give me a PNG of the screen. It's more like request the user to accept whether you want to, like, I guess it takes a screenshot and it shows you a screenshot in dialog. Where do you want to save this? And you save it, and you get the file path back to the, uh, to the app that called this. Uh, there's a device portal. It's just kind of a generic thing where you can express your wish to access some kind of device. And then you can grant it or not grant it. Um, it's typically you, you might not know that the app is going to use the joystick. So you can say in this way, I am, I'm going to use the joystick. And if, if, the app isn't allowed to do that, it will pop up in the dialog. But the next time when you try to do that, it knows that, so it does nothing. It just, it's just a way to get a, uh, a hook into the thing is going to need this thing. And right now, we only support microphones, speakers, and cameras. But we want to extend that to, because things like joysticks and DVDs and CD. CD-ROMs or CDs. Uh, and this is a uh, portal for inhibiting screen, like idling, screen saver, all those kind of things. Uh, it's basically a wrapper of the uh, existing login D thing, I think. We want to do more portals. Actually, the, the, the list of stuff we have is kind of the most important things. One other really important thing for GNOME in particular is having a way for dconf to work sanely in sandboxing. Right now, you can like give it access to various things, and it dconf works. But you're able to read everyone's dconf messages and everyone's dconf settings. And what we want is some kind of setup where you can declare what part of the tree you can see, and you can always see yours. And every, anything else never ever reaches your sandbox. Uh, yeah, we want more devices. Yeah, USB access is another thing we want to add. Actually, we added this 
hammer thing where you can give it access to all your devices uh, because uh, that that was added recently. So it it is possible to like run flat packs that have access to all kinds of devices. However, those are just a hammer thing. It's not per device type. It's not something you get asked for. It's just an install time thing. This thing has full access. We want to have something like sharing in Android and iOS where you can select some text or an image and like share this and it will ask you whether you want to tweet it or put it on Facebook or whatever. And uh, we don't really have an API for that in our current code, so I'm not sure where we're going to hook that in, but it would be very nice to have as a you know, just a generic modern thing that desktops should have. Another complicated one is contacts. Contacts are not really standardized between desktops. Maybe we can have a way to like give a get a desktop independent list of V cards or something for for generic contacts querying, but unclear exactly how that would work. And we also need a bunch more infrastructure for the portal stuff to really work. All the sandboxing is completely useless if you're using X anyway. So we need to work on making Wayland just work and for everyone to switch to it. And uh, also, Wayland needs a few more interfaces to make it possible to do some things. In particular, we, there's no way for the sandbox app and the uh, portal dialog to have any kind of connect because they're different. Uh, they're di different. Cr clients in the Wayland compositor, and they are completely isolated. But we do want the portal file chooser to parent to the actual window, so we need some kind of API. And Jonas has been working on a way to do this kind of minimal cross-client interactions. Pulse Audio is the way we do audio currently, but it is completely unsafe right now. It's getting better. Like Pulse Audio 9 added the uh, MFD ceilings stuff, so it's slightly more safe. But basically, you can ask the Pulse Audio daemon to load any DLL or whatever using a call, and it will like load a plugin from the host and into your Pulse Audio process and do whatever. That needs to be tightened up, and it needs to be wired up to some kind of portal API. Yeah, I mean, it's, it just needs work to be more solid. Uh, yeah. Um, and it, there's this other project called Pinoas or Pinoas or Penis or something, <laughs> uh, which is similar to Pulse Audio, but for, for webcams and cameras. Uh, and we need to, I think that, that was designed for the specific purpose. So it's probably pretty safe in terms of the, the, the Interfaces are not completely unsafe, but we need to still wire it up with the portal for you know actually verifying which client is calling and does it have permissions to do this or that. We also need better integration of Flatpak into GNOME, and by GNOME I mean GNOME the project, not GNOME the technical details. Uh, I have been doing most of the work for all the run times, and and. A few people have been doing work on the uh, app porting or building things as app. This needs to be a more project-wide thing. I'm thinking the release team could have a, some kind of maintenance duty, or at least they could do the releases of the runtime, and we, we could have a larger team work on that. I want the individual maintainers of apps to be in control of their actual application manifests, how you build them in Flatpak. So it could be part of maintaining due to you to, when you, once you do a release, you also like update the JSON file so we get a new Flatpak build. It should be pretty, pretty easy once it, the, the files are packaged. So it's not a huge deal, but making the individual maintainers do that just keeps the load more sane for me. and the people doing the Flatpak work. There's also a question of where we keep the Flatpak build manifests. 
uh, in terms of maintenance. Now there's like a one single Git repository on the GNOME server that has all the manifests for all the apps, which is very nice for the auto build system, but because we can just update that one and build everything in it. And whenever something changes, it, we just pull that again and build it. But in terms of maintenance, it makes more sense for each individual repository to store its own build description. But then it, it's more complicated to automatically build it, so it's something of a trade-off that we need to figure out how to how the whole like build system setup should work. And the automatic build system used it's a bunch of scripts. It needs more work. It needs to be maintained by more people. More people need to look at the log files when something goes south and things like that. It, we want more apps ported. We had a workshop yesterday. We got a bunch more apps ported, which is nice. The more things we get ported, the easier it is for other. I mean, we fix bugs. People can look at how, how other people did things. So it's nice to have that. And I guess we should somehow centralize information about what what was ported so that you can find more examples and don't duplicate work. We have been looking at doing a, a long-term support runtime based on something like CentOS 7, which is super minimal and doesn't rev often, but has the kind of long-term security support that a, a, a real product, I mean, I try to we, or, or the GNOME as a project will try to have security updates for GNOME runtimes. But if we rev every six months, we have to decide some kind of limit, like after three releases or something, we used cannot support everything. Whereas the minimal runtime can be supported for a very long time. On the other hand, it will be ancient crap in it, so you need to bundle your, whatever you need. But it's a, it's a great fit for what like the commercial or slow moving projects need anyway. So, you know, if you're Adobe and releasing Acrobat, you don't need the latest GDK or whatever. You just bundle Motif or whatever you want in there and it should work. And as a future ideas, which are very hazy right now and we want to discuss more at the uh, buff on Monday, I think. How do we get it so that when people start GNOME software the first time, they have a bunch of apps in there? We have to curate and make it possible for people to find the apps. Right now, it's like a bunch of things spread out all over the place, and it's impossible to find that. Could we have a GNOME supported or some other organization supported application store where we could curate upstreams and also like handle the load of everyone using them because even though upstreams could like have their own repositories for their projects it's unlikely they're going to handle the load of everyone getting updates from them all the time another idea is to have a kind of github copper ppa thing a web service where you create a user, you log in, you create a remote, and you upload your JSON file, and it builds on all the platforms we support. And then you can pull from your remote and verify that that thing works. And then you can sign it and like push it to some kind of official repository. Where So this is a way for developers that don't have the infrastructure to do their own repository to easily distribute binaries. There are all sorts of complexities here, like legal, bandwidth, the, the servers, the build things, cost money. But I think it's something we probably need for Flatpak to reach a wider audience uh, in terms of developers using it. And also, it's an easy way to hook up the App Store idea, like if we can easily tag something that you build in your flat hub thing to uh, the app store. We, we can easily get a curated list of everything that's in there. Maybe it could be actually be connected to GitHub. You hook up your GitHub to, to flat hub and it just looks at the git commits 
And also an interesting thing, I think actually super important, is payment. I want people to be able to pay for free software. I not necessarily have to pay, but if someone wants to get paid, or rather if someone wants to pay, it should be possible. 